Hi, it's Mark, and today we're going to be talking to Mike O'Malley. We discuss the many schools of acting. I'm going to play a Stone Cold Killer on <laughs> Justified. And the fact that there's no schools for fatherhood. I was just like, oh my gosh, that went by so fast. And the importance of long-standing friendships. You would always tell me little things like, remember, just gently grab the elbow here and push this way because the audience is here. I'm dead serious. And most importantly, having the guts to go after what you really want to do. Guts. You know what I mean? Guts. So don't forget to like and subscribe to Mark Summers Unwraps. Put yourself in a scary situation and see if you can crawl out of it. There's mm -hmm. nothing better to me. I don't know what that is. And and maybe every performer feels that way. There were times where I would, when I was started at the Magic Castle, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I would throw up before every show. Uh, that's how sick I was. I was wow. so nervous because I knew I sucked and I didn't have an act and I had to go out there and do like 20 minutes and they were going to hate me. And um, I forget who it was, but some performer and all the ones I met on the way up said to me, before you walk out on stage, say these words, these people came to see me. And that was a turning point for me as well. I never thought about these people came to see me. I thought, I'm going out there and do my little, you know, monkey dance, and hopefully they're going to like me. But by saying those words, these people came to see me, whether it was true or not, it kind of convinced me that maybe that was true, and it made me a better performer. So you told yourself, people came to see me, Mark Summers. Mm -hmm. Mark Summers, which is an AKA. Is mm -hmm. it like being a vigilante? Is that part of the persona <laughs> that you need a secret identity to be able to handle the stage? I never wanted to change my name. Uh, but when I woke up one morning and found out that the son of Sam was David Berkowitz, no relation, he was uh, actually adopted, uh, my agent called me up and said, uh, I can't even get you an audition now, so change your name. And the question is, what do you change your name to? It's something you kind of never think about. And I went through a million different things with alliterations. And back in the day when I was a disc jockey in the early days, it was always one syllable first names and two syllable last names. It just was, and that's what you had to do. And uh, growing up in Indianapolis on uh, WIFE radio, there was a guy by the name of Dick Summer. And I always loved Dick Summer. And then when I went to Boston, he was working at uh, a station uh, in Boston, in Framingham, as a matter of fact. And I got to meet him. And I always uh, admired his talent. So I took uh, Dick Summer and added an S and became Mark Summers. And uh, it changed my life. Hi everybody, Mark Summers here. We're going to unwrap a good friend of mine uh, in just a few moments. I've known this man, I think, more than 30 years, and in doing the research, uh, found out that I may be responsible in some uh, form or fashion um, for his uh, success, but I'll take zero credit for it. Um, please welcome the man who is, I, I, I just want to read some of these credits. Um, he was the star of uh, Yes, Dear, uh, for six years on CBS. Um, uh, my name is Earl. He was a regular on that. Um, many motion pictures, Eat, Pray, Love, uh, Concussion, Sully. Uh, if I go through all of his credits, we will have no time to talk. Please welcome uh, Mike O'Malley. How are you, sir? Mark, good to see you. Good <laughs> yes. to sit down and see you. Yes, we met, uh, I believe I was 24 years old. I was doing Get the Picture for Nickelodeon, and you were the big star, and you couldn't have been kinder and nicer and show me how to do the hosting stuff and uh we've been friends ever since ever since i was uh i was explaining to somebody earlier that somehow because i guess i had uh, a few years on you and a, and a good agent i was staying at a place called the uh, the villas of grand cyprus <laughs> and uh you were staying in some dorm somewhere <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thing it was like uh every everyone at nickelodeon wanted this mark summers deal so uh it was great it was like uh you know mark would push in negotiations for a little bit more and that meant that all of us could uh, ask for a little bit more if we had the same success that's the problem is that you were bringing in so much dough on the live show and just with you know the ratings of double dare and all the merch and then you were doing what would you do and you were doing all that stuff. I mean, I was doing Get the Picture, which was a, just a question and answer, almost like a Jeopardy kind of game show for kids where they had to guess pictures. And then once Guts became a little bit uh, bigger, um, I got to go out on the road and do some of what you did. But you really, you know, you paved the way for, for all of us. I mean, what's interesting about working at Nickelodeon for you and me back at that time is that we were two of the only adults. Yeah. Working there. And so if there was marketing events or other events to go out there and do that... 
if they were going to have, you know, say, uh, Melissa Joan Hart, they had to bring her mom. They had to have her. You know what I mean? It was, I mean, I hate to say it, it's like, it's like two plane tickets. It's two, you know, it's a bigger hotel room. It's whatever. They just like send O'Malley, send Summers. They'll deal with it. I, I just uh, spoke with Melissa. She's in uh, Nashville now and, you know, has grown up kids and is uh, older than I can even imagine uh, simply because it seems like. 10 minutes ago she was 11 or 12 yeah and now she's like 50 so how did that happen yeah so talented and just that her her whole family and she was you know she also just really put nickelodeon on the map with the sitcoms back then Um, she did it was a it was a great time to work down there in orlando and and honestly you know you've as i said you've been a great friend we don't have to tell each other that but uh you really helped me uh back when i was getting started to to take it you know, not only uh, take it seriously what we were doing, but to look at the, uh, just really kind of think about working with kids and how if we were older brothers, if we were kind of like camp counselors and somebody who were really there for them, um, it could be a great experience for them, but to always be thinking about that. And I'm not sure anybody even had any thought about what it is we should be doing, and that was a good point of view. I mean, at 24, you were thinking about that. At 31, I was 34. Uh, I just wanted to get on television. And so uh, I had been hosting run-throughs but never had a real show. And so that, that was kind of fun. And uh, we had a restaurant in, in, in this villa that I was staying at called the Black Swan. And you used to come over there um, and we used to have lunch and we would discuss futures and our business and, and what we should be doing. And so in doing the homework, it said um, <laughs> it says that on the advice of Mark Summers, you moved to L.A. after Guts was canceled to pursue your acting career. I have no recollection <laughs> of telling yeah, you. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on uh, on Wikipedia that is not a lot that's wrong, but I mean they usually get it right. You know, I guarantee you that you and I had some conversation along those lines. I did not. Sorry, Mark. I did not um, decide to become an actor because you told me at the Black Swan. <laughs> Thank, at God. The Villa. However, Thank God. Uh, <laughs> however. However. Um, you know, I think that I, you and I would often talk about what we wanted to do and your background having been in stand-up comedy and having done hosting and having done magic and but also being interested in doing musicals and doing theater and producing, we would always talk about those things. And I think in particular for me at that time, one of the things that I remember um, you doing for me was to realize that I was down there, think about it, I was just out of college a couple years. You know, I started working for Nickelodeon around 24 years old, and then I was and then I was there, you know, I mean, you and me were doing everything, 24, 25, 26, 27. But when you first come out of college, you know, for me, I grew up in New Hampshire and went to the University of New Hampshire and was, you know, I'd moved down to New York, but it was all about my experience with friends and with people. And so I always wanted to... You know, one of the reasons I went into the business, I wanted to bring that kind of, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, collegiality to the experience. It was fun. And I think that it was you after, you know, a couple of conversations, you realized, yeah, you know, work is work, but you're, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you're the host. You can't be going out, you know, hanging out and having beers with everybody in the entire crew. It's because... Other people don't look at it the way that you're looking at it. Other people say, well, wait a minute, you know, um, if you and I went out to dinner and we had some wine or whatever, there'd be somebody sitting there who's like, I can't believe they had two glasses of wine. Whatever it is. <laughs> I was still in that kind of young, I'm young stage. You had a, you were a little bit older, but you were still young yourself and you had that perspective to be like, okay, if you want to do this, you got to separate. I don't want to say you separate your friendships because we made great friendships down there, but I do think that work is work and your friends are friends and you can make friends like you and I have. And we sure enough, we made plenty of friends, but that there was no social media then as well. So, you know, there's a story that it's, it's in a book so I can tell it. Um, I was at a food show in Cleveland and at, uh, two in the morning, me and uh, Rachel Ray and Mario Batali and a few other people go to a strip club, okay? Right. Uh, there's no good that happens after 2 o'clock in the morning, especially yeah, yeah. in a, a strip club right. under a bridge in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Um, social media didn't <laughs> exist at yeah. that point. So you could get away with something back then a little easier. Now, 24-7, there's people with uh, cameras on their phones shooting everything, and the next thing you know, you're on TMZ. So Right, and to be, and to be on a, you know, it's like it doesn't matter that you're an, ad- an adult 
and you're going about your you know life doing whatever you're doing it's like you can't you can't be working at nickelodeon and like all of a sudden a <laughs> you know a shooting breaks out or something happens <laughs> i don't mean to be laughing at a shooting at a, i'm just saying no like, but i know, you what, know you mean. what i'm saying it's yeah. like you can't like take those chances why are you in a place that doesn't uh lend itself to the persona you're trying to put forth and so look it's something that we always have to think about and i um there was a there was a time in which i could go down that path and continue to do game shows and host game shows but that i i didn't want to do that i wanted to act i wanted to write and you can see how you know it's one of the reasons i really was thinking about oh okay well i should really try to start doing some stand up because it's easier to go from stand up comedian it's easier to explain a way that you're a game show host if you're a stand up comedian than it is if you're back then at least than is it if if you're an actor like what are you doing you're an actor and you're hosting this game show for me it was like uh, I had read Charles Grodin's uh, It Would Be So Nice If You Weren't Here, which anybody who has not read this He's autobiography, God rest his soul, he is just, this is probably the best autobiography on show business I've ever read. I, really. Um, he he would just talk about it as like, if, you're try, if you don't know anybody and you're trying to get in the business, just get in the business. Like just, he was doing Candid Camera with Ted Knight. Like he was... Uh, he went to school with Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman and Gene Wilder. And, you know, he's a brilliant actor, but he's like, just get your foot in there. Do, do something. And so that's what I was trying to do with Nickelodeon. Also, Nickelodeon didn't have this. Um, and I, I wasn't thinking ahead, but but Nickelodeon didn't have the awareness when we were working for it at first that it got. So if I was going to do uh, a, sh a show on Nickelodeon. None of my friends, none of the people my age knew what even Nickelodeon was because they hadn't grown up with it. Right. And so it wasn't like I wasn't thinking, you know, one day I'm going to be playing a, a, a murderer. On, <laughs> you know, like literally like now, right? I mean, yeah. this, this happens to me. I was like, I'm going to play a stone cold killer on Justify. <laughs> and some guy somewhere is going to say, gonna say I grew up the house of guts. Where's the aggro crack? <laughs> I'm a man. I can't take this guy seriously. <laughs> that never goes away, does it? It's hysterical. Well, to it me. goes away a little bit more for me because I look so much older and different than <laughs> I did. Um, you know, if you if you uh, you know, oh, you still got all your hair. I mean, it's like yeah, I look like uh, you know Father Time over here. I look older than you. But I mean, I think that that's part of it. It's like they, and you know what? It's it's also you can tell. It's a little bit of, you know, people trying to heckle you, trying to take you down. I'm, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I saw you, you know, trying to be, man, oh, guts. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> guts. <laughs> you know, and people come up, it's like, oh, it was my favorite show. It's like, I can tell when it was your favorite. You yeah. Know, I can tell when you're trying to take the piss a little bit. Well, you know, I was I wrote a thing on social media a couple of years ago about the, the 10 things that were said to me walking the streets of New York, and it's, hey, Double Dare guy, hey, uh, Food Network guy, what's Giada really like? Uh, do you really know Bobby Flay? And the last one was, hey, Summers, you suck, okay? Yeah, that's nice. And and that's New York, <laughs> and that's real yeah. life, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I wanna, yeah, I, I wanna... mean, I, I used to get, hey, Jimmy Kimmel. Um, uh, really? So, well, only because I played Jimmy on Yes, Dear, oh. and, and uh, you know. Good God. Like, yeah. So there's a story I want to tell you that I don't think I've ever told you. And uh, you were, um, well, I guess you were 30. Uh, you wrote a play off-Broadway called uh, Three Years from 30. Yes. And you called me and said, uh, are you in New York? I said, yes. You said, I want you to come and see my show. I went, okay. Where is it? It's off-Broadway. And I think you were on like 33rd and 11th or something. You were in the middle You're of right. It was 20, a good memory. It was 23rd. And, uh, and, and yeah, 11. <laughs> okay. So I get there and it was like, you know, uh, one step better than, uh, you know, a public urinal. And, 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 and <laughs> all right. We, we tried a little Lysol there. I mean, for God's sakes, we had potpourri on the bathroom, but it was a 74 seat theater. Seven, okay. So I thought 99 seats. So 74 seat theater. And all I'm thinking was, I don't know Mike that well. I don't know how we got a show on in New York. But there's no way in hell it's going to be any good. Mm -hmm. So all the way over there, I'm trying to think, what can I say? Because, you know, when you say uh, the scene, scenery was great or yeah, I yeah. love the music, you know, you're screwed. And so I sat down just in my mind trying to figure out what, what, what. <laughs> and by the end of the show, I was in tears. You had me crying. Okay. And I thought to myself, how did this guy write 
this intense of a program and bring me to tears. And so I go backstage and I went, holy shit, how did you do this? And where did this come from? And I guess the question is, you've always been wise beyond your years. And tell the folks what that show was about. Uh, so thank you for saying that, Mark. And I remember when you came back and it meant a lot to me. I was uh, 28. The play was called Three Years from 30. It's published by Samuel French. You can get it on uh, Amazon.com. <laughs> I will not get any money from that. <laughs> Why? Uh, because they're all used copies. Uh, uh. So, But please, go out and read the play. Uh, it was a play, you know, for me, I thought that one of the hardest times in my life was the time between the year I got, the years I graduated from college up until that time in my life where I was 28 years old. So that period of time uh, from 21 to 28, uh, I think is, is a time that's not spoken about enough in terms of what, what it feels like uh, as, as you're trying to, you trying know, to find your way, trying to find your way, get out of college, understand like, what can I do? You also, you know, for me, I wanted to get married. I wanted to have a family. Uh, you always feel the future kind of showing its border, especially once around, once the time you get around 25, 26 years old. And so I also think that there's a lot of people that, you know, for, and, and I'm just talking about the time when, when I was, uh, you know, so this is 19, I moved to New York in the fall of 1988. So 1988, 1999, you know, uh, 1990, this is a period of time when, um, you know, you, you don't have any money. Your friends are back in New Hampshire and New England. You got some friends in New York. New York is an absolutely, uh, you know, it's an incredibly difficult place to live when you're poor, you feel on the outside of things. Everyone, when you're first going to show business, that's when everyone pours into the business. I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be a writer. I want to be in the movies. I want to do this. And so there's a lot of people your age doing that. And so what the play was about was this guy and this gal, this gal who wanted to go pursue her dream, but she thought that the relationship was holding her back because he wanted to get settled down. And what what that what that time period is like where if you, in that in that age of 21 to 28, and I know that 21's a lot, you know, there's not a lot of people get married that young anymore, but, um, and I wasn't ready to get married at that age. It's like, what happens when you've met somebody that's really right for you, but your interests and your pursuits are going in a different direction and you can't put the time that a relationship requires because it does require time and attention and, and the timing is really off, right? Because you have to be, um, you know, just working your tail off and other people do too. And you're constantly meeting other people and they're meeting other people. And so the resiliency to make a relationship really work, I think that that's a difficult time for people. It's in part what the play was about, three different relationships, um, about that, where they were, and and trying to manage that. And so I think that I've, I've, I've just always been interested with uh, what it means to try to be uh, you know, a good person, connect with people, be a good friend. Um, but, I, but as I was saying, I was always someone who, I was always, uh, looking for, uh, a woman to marry that I was going to have kids with. And I, I can think about that. Like, I mean, that was how, it like, doesn't mean I was like not attracted to or see somebody or want to, you know, go on a date or have, you know, fun with somebody who, but, I, but I, but after that, I was always I was always looking for okay, wait a minute, who's somebody? Because I really wanted to have kids and really wanted to be a dad. I'm not saying like look look at me, I want to. I'm just saying I just really wanted to do that, and I know that's what I wanted my life to be about in part. And so that um, that's a very sort of I don't even say lofty thing. It's a the thing that you realize when you're a dude is that if you don't have the the woman, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine I'm, that. I'm always saying that to my sons. I'm always like, look, man, uh, just letting you know, the <laughs> greatest thing is having you guys and my daughter. But I say this particularly to my sons. It's like, you know, if, you know, your mom is the whole reason this thing's great. Not that I don't know what I contribute to it, but, th but that it's like, um, you know, my happiness has so much to do with the thing that the two of us are doing together. It's not... Uh, and so I think that that's what that play was about. And I've always been, I think that, you know, maybe 
maybe what you were responding to or and then listen i've been there like oh my god i gotta go see this guy play like what am i gonna say i love the lighting you know what i mean it's terrible it's terrible I know, I know. but you got it you gotta fake it yeah. you know what i mean it's the only it's the only good lie you can tell as to the performer that that it's good but you know what's interesting is that i had i had really really worked very 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 hard at on that and the people at nickelodeon jerry Layborn, um albie hecht um Herb Scannell, uh, James Bethea, Stuart Rosenstein, all these people that we knew, they were very supportive in that too because they all, they not only recognized that I wanted to do it, but and they would support me like Nickelodeon bought out a night and brought everyone really? there. It's like yeah, they were really great, and and and, and so it was like. You know, what was that? I mean, 74 tickets at $15 a pop. Yeah, it was nothing. But I mean, but they still did it. Yeah. And, um, Didn't have to. And so they were very supportive back then of what other people wanted to do because I think everybody always wants to do something else. And having a curiosity about the people that in your life, what do they do? How can I help? That that is a, um, you know, that's something that, you know, a lot of people that I know and my friends and you know, they, they're, it's always like, how can I help you? How can I help? What can I do to help? Is there anything I can do to help? Yeah, but most people aren't that way. You're yeah. supposed to pay it forward in life, uh, a term that didn't exist back when you and I were paying it forward. Right. But, um, yeah, but you did it naturally, right? I always tell the story about you where we were putting on this live show and you had done, had all this success and we were going to go out in big arenas and you had done it. And yes, they, you know, they, they might have been, you know, paying you a little bit to come and help us. But the fact is, is that that was, that was not paying your mortgage. You coming to help us do the show. You were just doing it out of the goodness of I your heart. I wanted to come. And not only that, it's like you recognize, like, I would just, you would always tell me little things like, remember, just gently grab the elbow here and push this way because the audience is here. I'm dead serious. I'm dead That's serious. Hysterical. You want this guy, if you're going to go out in the audience, you know, pick the guy with the shirt that's, you know, it's going to fly up when he's dancing because it'll be funny. You know what I mean? Whatever it is. You know, uh, you know, there's little things where you were feeling as if you were you were paying it forward. And and that helps. Um, that helps. Do you consider yourself to be an intense person? <laughs> Not only do I. Look. Look. I've come to accept the fact that I am an intense person. Okay. It's so funny that you say that is because I think that like when I'm <laughs> when I'm on when I'm like people see me like I'm in yesteryears is like goofy guy, blah blah blah, or I play the Rick or whatever. Like it's just like, oh funny. I have been told that I'm intense uh since I was a kid. I've had many girlfriends be like, Wow, you're intense. Like you're intense. Uh I've had friends, you know, say one of my best friends He's like, so, somebody's saying, what, what, what was one word you used to describe Mike? And he goes, complex. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> I think, uh, yes. Would you describe me as intense? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, and yeah. Y you would intimidate the crap out of me uh, early on, and I'll tell you why. You're so well read and your vocabulary. I didn't have a phone to look things up, but you used to say words and I go, I have no idea what that word means. Okay. Now I know if you read and you you grab a better vocabulary because yeah. you have to Okay, but I, I never read as much as you and you would you were into uh, like education at one point yeah. and you had recommended books for me to go yeah. and read, which I, I went out and bought, by the way. <laughs> and and you know, trying to fix the world. You were so intense about correcting things. And I'm thinking to myself, ever since I've known you, when you were basically a kid, um, you've always had this, holy shit, I've got to do this. I have this mission. I've got to get this accomplished. Yeah. You need to read this. You need to... <laughs> and, and, and you yeah. know, and you see things that most people don't see. And I, I was telling one of our producers here that when you came to see my documentary, you said to me, how come you didn't mention your father? Okay. Yeah. And you said it was, it was a glaring problem to you that i didn't bring him up and that i needed I didn't to go say, back. no no hold on uh i did not i i, I there's not listen that's how you heard a glaring problem i think i said because i thought that you were going to then take your um I'm, I'm leaning back so i don't blow out people's uh, ears when i laugh <laughs> i think that what i was and if i said problem forgive me i what i was saying is that there is a you're trying to pour yourself open here mm -hmm. and it's very brave and you're pouring yourself open, you've done this throughout your life. And it's because of your courage to talk about things, uh, whether it's OCD or, um, you know, your accident in the taxi and uh, just, just everything, your journey, uh, that I thought, 
okay, you opening yourself up, and then yet throughout this, I'm curious. I'm, I'm just like, what is this? So I just thought it was an opportunity, and I was I thought in the documentary it was another shoe that was going to drop, because you are a great dad, you are a great advocate for other people, you're interested in other people, you mentor other people, and yet here is, you know, I just wanted to know where is he, and. And I and I and I can understand why uh, you might not want him to be in this, but I think I just said it's a it's a it's a glaring omission to me. Yeah, right. And uh, and maybe that's because I live so much in the fictional world of uh, totally examining where. Did, okay, person came from here. Whose mother? Whose father? What is the thing? How did they do it? You're what talking is it about that... backstory when you're writing a right. show. Okay, right. where do these people come from? Mm -hmm. And we were sitting in a cafe in Hollywood, and this is easily four or five years ago, and I haven't forgotten that at all. COVID happened and things got delayed. But you've mentioned, I, I, I have hundreds of notes here, and, and we're going in seven directions here, but you mentioned several times now in the first 24 minutes about being a dad, okay? Yeah. You recently took your daughter to college. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And we didn't get a chance to talk, but we were doing social media or uh, texting or emailing or something. And you were somewhat of a mess, I think, when yeah. you dropped her off. Uh, I mean, I would see, I would describe it as I was, um, I was mess. I mean, I, look, I got on the plane. I, I was communicating. Through, but it's your daughter. Text. She's the no, oldest, no, 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 right? No. I would say this. I was not a mess. I was sad. And I and, I, and I'll say this. I if, Since I uh, look, dude, I'm Irish Catholic. I have no problem showing talking your about my feelings yeah. or showing anybody what they are, right. which is why it is intense. Right. I'm not afraid to say to you, hey, man, it's really good to see you. You, you look awesome, man. How's it going? I was thinking about you. Like some people are like, oh, okay, right? It's like, because I'm interested, right? right? You are, I truly. Don't, I'm, I'm literally trying to, you know, squeeze everything out of the grape of life too. And so, you know, for me, saying to you as I was texting, you, I was like, how you doing? I'm like, I probably sent you a picture of me hugging her goodbye. Yes, I'm like, yes. I'm fucking bummed. Yeah. Why? Because my life just went by. I was sitting in the backyard yesterday and I was looking at these lights I had strung up for a party for her when she was in ninth grade. And I was... Um, I was like, oh my gosh, that went by so fast. And I think for me, what happened, being a parent, nobody talked about this for me. And this is just something that dawned on me, like in the last couple of years, that this person that you raise, okay, like my 10 year old son who I coached on the baseball team. And here's the, you know, you make the mistake of putting the iPhotos up on the Apple TV and, and they're in the background and then these photos are going back and they back and forth. And it seemed like two seconds ago for you. And what it is, is, and I mean this in the way that I'm saying this, that person, that 10 year old guy is gone. He's never coming back. You love that guy. You love the 12 year old guy. You love the eight year old guy. You love the 14. You love the 16. You love all of who they are. You have no experience because when I see you, I just see you as the guy I met all those years ago, 35 years ago, whatever it is. And, and you, you know, you, we both look a little bit older, but essentially we're the same people yeah. with, with children. And so for my daughter, I think that she's going off to school and I was so excited about it for her, but I love her. I love seeing her. Like I get something from her when I, when she's in my life, like her being in my presence, like walking into the kitchen and talking to her, even if it's like, we're not a, we're the least codependent family on earth because we're all off in our own directions. But there's ballast that comes from uh, the proximity, being able to talk to one another about things, being able to, for me in particular as a dad, you're so want to be able to sniper in on whatever issues going uh, on with them that sometimes you're not going to catch unless you're there. So I know that she's, and this is how life goes, right? I'm away from my parents. My parents love me the same way I love my kids. I, it's, I'm just saying, it doesn't, you know, the love goes down a way that it doesn't come back up. Like I love my parents, but I'm not thinking about them all the time. My parents, are, and I'm not saying my parents are thinking about me all the time. I'm just saying it's like- How old are your parents? 82. 82. Yeah. And, yep. and what's your daughter want to do? She's uh, She wants to be in, in film and television. And tell me about your sons. My sons, uh, I have a son who's 17, and he's a junior in high school. He's a baseball player, and I have a son who's 
14 years old, and he's a basketball player and a boxer and a surfer, and he's into everything. You uh, you coach baseball, as I coach baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we would have those conversations yes. about the intensity of the parents yes. who thought that their kids were actually going to play on the Dodgers yes. someday when we know that that's never going to happen. Yes. And yet they... Uh, treat those of us who donate our time to be coaches like we're, you know, the ogres of the world because we didn't let their kid, you know, pitch uh, in the bottom of the ninth. And and <laughs> talk about intensity and being, you know, chased in my car, as I'm sure you were several times. Yeah. And, you know. I, I don't miss that part. Of no, it. no, not at all. Um, so uh, keeping this theme of, of being intense, you've had tremendous success. Um, I think one of the things that you've m- might have been the most fun uh, from my perspective, was was playing the Rick. Yeah, but the Rick is is Michael Malley, isn't it? <laughs> well, the Rick is a character on ESPN that was actually created by Steve O'Brien and this guy that I went to college with, uh, Court Crandall, who is a fanatic sports fan, and they've used him over the last twenty years in a ad campaign for ESPN, for ESPN.com, ESPN News. Um, all, you know, a bunch of different ESPN stuff. And the, but he was a fanatic. He was not a yelling, screaming, face painter kind of fan. He was a guy who thought, like the Rick would take this. <laughs> I'm holding up a, a uh, KN95, well, it's not a KN95. I'm holding up a, a, you know, COVID mask, one of those blue surgical masks. This is what the Rick would say. He'd put this in a plastic bag and he'd say, um, this is something that I saw uh, Barry Bonds throw out at the airport in San Francisco. And um, is a little bit of mustard here. But I put this here. And um, so this is just one of, one of the things in my collection that I'm willing to sell. So I'm going to put this up for bid on eBay. And uh, you know what I mean? He would just have the most ridiculous, stupid stuff that he thought was worth money. And... Uh, that was a, that was fun. Christopher Guest directed the first. Oh, really? Yeah, he directed the. I didn't know that. Yeah, this this was this was back in '98 when we shot those. Oh man! So that was when he was really doing his mockumentary stuff, and it was really coming around. And then, and uh, yeah, Chris Guest was great. One of you know, he said I was a great improviser. Introduced me to somebody as a great improviser once. I thought I was gonna you know keel over. I was so happy. You know, we talk on the show a lot about overcoming obstacles. Mm-hmm. First sitcom for you was? Life with Roger. Tell me about that. Uh, that was a show that was on, that was developed for NBC. Um, you know, back in the day, early days, when there was only three networks, or, you know, I, I guess there was three broadcast networks, and then you had Fox, which was called the Netlet, believe it or not. And then um, and then there were two other smaller networks that were made up of, you know, former UHF stations, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the WB. Anyways, I had done a pilot. If you were a young actor, the the basically the way it would happen is that that every network would make like thirty pilots, and it was one of the ways in which to not only develop new ideas, but to also develop new showrunners. And it was almost kind of like the minor leagues, so you could get paid you know, fifty thousand dollars to go do a pilot, which you know you're you're twenty four, twenty five years old. That's a lot of money, and um, and then you had it had the option of going. And what would happen is, as it got to the end of the line, you know, the end of the development season, everyone's trying to jockey for position, right? And so I'm not going to take this. This has no chances. This is going to go. Oh, here's this, you know, here's two writers who wrote on, you know, Seinfeld. They've got their brand new pilot and they something funny and give it a shot. They're going to make it, you know, just a shot in the dark because the, the networks would make 25, 30 pilots, comedy pilots and pick up four. Right, so that was the odds. I had been cast in a show for NBC called um, Life with Roger, and believe it or not, I got it was between me and Paul Giamatti for the part. What? And they had us ride to the final testing at the same time. And I already knew Paul; just I knew him as an actor in New York. I just knew how great he was. Oh, amazing! So I thought there was no chance I'm getting this, and. Um, I got lucky. I got it, and then I don't know what's happened to Paul since then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've seen uh, him around. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, he's so good, and uh, and so yeah, I won that battle. And uh, and how Paul, many episodes? We did 20, 20. 20 episodes of that show, and then that got uh, it was on the WB. So it was done for NBC, and then that got passed on. It was done for the WB. Then what happens if you if you 
you know, acquit yourself if you do all right. They'll give you a, a production deal to do a production deal. They'll, they'll they'll give you a deal to say like we don't want you to go to CBS or ABC. We're gonna do another sitcom with you. Or somebody else will say like Warner Brothers will say we want you to we're gonna give you a holding deal. We're gonna pay you you know seventy five thousand dollars. You can't take anything else, but we're gonna put you in one of our things. And that's what you want, right? Because then you're you're, you're eliminating you're limiting your opportunities, but you're having guaranteed income. It's kind of like you're signed to a contract with this studio, and you can't go do anything. At, that might be better for you someplace else. You got to do this. And as a performer, knowing that uh, income may or may not happen this week, somebody offers you a chunk of change. You go, yeah, I'm going to do that because I have mortgage payment, kids, and you know, I want to eat. Right. And at the same time, I'm doing like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm writing plays. I'm, I'm trying to get my own stuff on. I'm trying to do stuff. I'm trying to be, you know, one of the reasons I wrote my own plays is I want to be seen, you know, in the parts that I thought I was, you know, good enough to do, but that, you know, you got to you. You know, you're waiting for somebody else to give you a job. And so I then did another pilot for Fox um, with Sam Simon, who co-created The Simpsons, and that didn't go. And then as a result of that, I got a deal to do my own sitcom for NBC, and th- well, that was in 1999, the fall of 1999, and we were one of only two sitcoms. That was like the height of must-see TV. And mm. so uh, we were only... Uh, one of two sitcoms to get picked up. We were going to be on after Will and Grace. And and what a lot of people don't know was a miniseries. It was a two-episode series. It was a miniseries. It was intended as a miniseries. And so it was only two episodes. We only did two episodes. I didn't know that. And and so <laughs> when did you make the transition from actor to writer to producer? You directed? Mm-hmm. How did that happen? Well, I was doing uh, Yes, Dear, and loving... Being on that show, um, we did 120 episodes, but I had wanted to then do drama because I had mostly only done comedy, and and that's when I got... I did a couple other shows, with a show with Christian Slater, and I had done some other stuff, but I was always trying to get my own thing going. And then I got cast in Glee, and I was doing Glee, and I knew that I was going to be doing a bunch of, par, a bunch of episodes on that, but I wanted to... Weren't you originally signed just to do one? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. When you get to be our age, at that point, I was, uh, gosh, that was probably 2010 or 2009 when I did my first episode. So I knew enough that the show had already premiered and it was successful. And I knew the show was about kids in high school. And if I was established as the dad, well, we're not going to get a new dad. I mean, they could hit me (laughs) with a bus. But I was like, yeah, this is, you know, it's not a bad gig. And they shot it right down the street. And I also knew Ryan Murphy. I had done a pilot with him, and I knew Brad Fulcheck, and I knew those guys. I liked those guys. And um, and so they asked me to come in and just do this part one episode, and I sort of just added it up as like, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm right down the street. I like these guys. I want to work with them on something else. I'm going to go take the job. That's another thing I would say to anybody. You know, people turning down jobs. Yeah, just take it's the, like, just take the job, yeah, man. Exactly. Just go work with people. People want to find out that you're not insane, and then they'll want to work with you again. <laughs> they may have found out I'm insane. I mean, maybe they think intense is insane. But so anyway. Let's you, talk about that part, though, yeah. okay? Um, it was a, You had a gay son. Yeah. And you were the father. Yes. And there was sort of a come to Jesus in a, yeah. a, a the conflict that was going on 10 years ago about having gay children and right. how do you cope with that. What did you draw from? from? Because, uh, you know, people were going crazy thinking O'Malley is fantastic, one of the best things he's ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, what research did you have to do or was it just you? I think I just, you know, for me, it was really well written. And what I liked about it was it wasn't like... Um, I just love my kid. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't think that there's anybody... I, by the way, I don't even think there's anybody back whenever who had a kid who... This particular character, for those of you who haven't seen the show, is a show It's based in Ohio. Uh, the, my character is a sort of flannel-wearing... Uh, blue collar uh, But mechanic, you yeah. know what I mean? I want my son to play football, blah, blah, blah. And his he catches his son dancing in a leotard to Beyonce... And uh, the kid lies about being on the football team. Then he goes on the football team. And then uh, then he, you know, his father bas- basically says, he, this, the, the kid announces to his dad, comes out and he says, I'm gay. And his dad says, I've known since you were three. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And he's like, I'm not saying I know how to deal with this, but it doesn't mean I love you any less. And that's what I loved about how they wrote it because they wrote it to be like, okay, now it's not going to, you know, some people are like, oh, we're going to go march in a parade. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's like him just saying, admitting is like, I love you. I don't know. I have any idea because his, his wife, who's the mother of, of Chris Colfer's character, Kurt, she's died. So it's just him and his son. And you know, he talks about, he's like, look, I wanted to be able to go to the football. He's not, my kid's not interested in football. There, there, There's a disconnect there in terms of their interest, but that doesn't mean that there's a disconnect in terms of, you know, their love from one another. And I think it's, for me, I just thought it's on the parent to love their kid and meet their, meet their children where they are. I'm not saying if your kid wants to do, try, you know, heroin, you meet him where he is or any of that stuff. I'm just saying like, it's, it's hard to be a kid and what I'm really grateful for my parent, for, you know, from my parents and, and how my parents were is that I never really had to ever, that I can remember, um, have to take into account my parents' emotional life, what was going on with them, that I'd have to carry some of that for them. I mean, obviously, as, you know, your parents get older and other things, but even still, my parents are extremely just... They're unto themselves. I'm very lucky that way. I know that I'm lucky that way, but that's also something that I want to be for my kids. I want to be, you know, as a parent, if you're a, I, I understand people split up, they marry the wrong person, the marriage changes, something changes, whatever. But if you're a bad parent, if you're just, if you screw that up, you're really, it's, it's the one thing that just is, is leading to so much unhappiness, right? It's like the world is, you know, cause you're a dad and, I mean, you see your kids go out in the world and they get disappointments, you know, for anything, a relationship, an opportunity that they want that didn't play out. They don't, the thing that they wanted to do, it didn't turn out how it is. And they come back in the house and you just want to, you know, wrap your arms around them and <laughs> say, hey, man, you got to keep going. Don't worry. We love you. And you try, because that's all you can say. That's all you say. But there's no schools on how to be a parent. Okay. And I remember when Matthew was born. We were living in a condo in Chatsworth, California, and every day at 3 o'clock, I'd sit on the staircase and cry like a baby. And Alice would come down to me and say, why are you crying? And I said, I have no idea what the hell I'm supposed to be doing, okay? <laughs> and so fast forward the tape, and I guess what was going on, and you're playing psychiatrist and psychologist for me right now in some ways. Um, I wanted to be in theater. But growing up in the Midwest uh, in the 60s, uh, as much as I, I was in, you know, Bye Bye Birdie and a local production, a few things, my parents kind of wanted me not to be in that world, okay? And at one point, I wanted to take ballet lessons. Mm -hmm. And my father said, over my dead body, is my son going to take ballet lessons? Okay, the answer is absolutely not, okay? Right. So to piss him off, I started taking baton lessons, paid for by myself from a cheerleader at North Central High School. And every Wednesday, I went to her house and was flipping batons. And I'd come home and practice in front of him just to make him angry, okay? And... Um, See, how's this not on the documentary? This is a <laughs> glaring omission. This is what, by the way, you have a glaring problem with your documentary and that you didn't talk about baton lessons. I, didn't, I know. Okay. And being in, in, in ballet. And so, you know. No, I'm calling it a problem now, Mark. Okay. I, I'm specifically saying it's a problem. <laughs> Get in there with the scissors and we do it. And fix that thing, right? And we will. But but my point is, there were things that I wanted to do that, you know, 60s Indiana, uh, Jewish conservative parents, they were not going to happen, okay? And so I put that in the back of my head. So at some point I knew that my kids were going to be in a similar situation. And therefore, I think, and I don't know, you could call my kids right now and ask them, I tried to open up those doors for them and whatever they wanted to do, whether I agreed with it or not, was okay. Okay. Now, yeah. not every parent gets to that point because, you know, if you're a doctor, you may want your kid to be a doctor. If you're a lawyer, you may want your kid to be a lawyer. I just wanted my kids to do whatever they wanted to do. I would get mad uh, when my daughter was performing and she didn't want to become Meredith Summers and she just wanted to become Meredith Clare. And I said, it's such a stupid business that if you can capitalize off my name, you should yeah. do it. But her deal, and by the way, I respect her for it, is I want to do it on my own. Okay. Right. Um, and so you go through these trials and tribu tribulations as a parent, and all you can do is the best job that you can do. But that performance on that show sort of hit home for me in many ways, um, being from the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, 
and the way you played that part. And and thank you for giving the writers credit. But the performance was a whole other thing. Yeah, but you know what? It, it, it thank you. But the performance is you've done you know you've done your work. You can't play it if it isn't there. Right. They can't give you the opportunity. How old was you, when was your dad born? Nineteen twenty-five. Okay, so think about your dad. He grows up. He's a kid during the depression. He comes out of the depression. He's puts it together. He's a conservative Jewish guy living. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, where did you Freaking from? Indianapolis, Indiana. I mean, Indiana. come on, man. I, I mean, I, gotta, you gotta, I mean, listen, the guy doesn't want you throwing a baton around. He's just being practical. Okay, it, yeah, listen. This oh. is interesting. Um, my brother and I, after my dad passed away a few years ago, decided that we were going to go and trace his steps during World War II. Mm -hmm. And we found a guy who it took us a year to get the meeting with him. And my brother and I and our wives fly over to, to Normandy. Um, and you find out he fell in love with a major. <laughs> And he couldn't be with that majorette <laughs> because You're he was in love with your man. mother. <laughs> You're such a sick man. Um, and and I realized my dad came back shell shocked, or uh, you know, of course, oh, yes. you know, sort. And and he was trapped by a sniper. And this guy pulled up material and ideas that I had no idea. Of my dad and I thought to myself, he was 18 years old. There was no way in hell I could have ever done what he did. Okay, I, I That's gave not him a, true. No, no. I, Mark, I'm telling you right now. Okay, you are a resilient strong, motivated dude. If you got drafted to go to the army and you went there- He volunteered you back then. Okay, you know? okay, well then, you know, kudos to your dad. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, you know, I'm, this is no, obviously, complete respect to your father who's not in your documentary. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but- For now. But I, but I want to say this, like we have to, as, as men, we have to, uh, we have to honor the people who have helped us we have, have to honor, you know, we stand on the shoulders of all these people who fought for, you know, people's freedom. And, and thank God, you know, my dad was in Vietnam for a year. I couldn't be more grateful uh, for what he did and, you know, for us and, and that he did his duty. But you would have done your duty if you were called upon to do your duty. I have no doubt about that. Maybe. And no, I mean this. And, and so there's other ways to be courageous and speak up, you know, for things and to define being courageous, how you, this, I, that, that, and I don't think that one trumps the other. I just, I want you to know this. This is really, really important. There are other ways to be courageous that help us move the ball forward as human beings, as people who love one another. And it's not just, you know, yes, oh my God, would anything, you know, could I compare, um, you know, someone struggling with uh, depression and overcoming it and and trying to speak about it and being courageous enough to speak about it to being you know mowed down by a sniper of course not i'm not trying to say that but i think that your father would be so proud of you and what you have accomplished and that you had that you know the guts to go after things after people said and did things and you know whatever i mean it's like the fact that your father didn't want you to do these things and you still got out of yeah <laughs> indianapolis yes. to do this is pretty good but no thank you so much for coming on my podcast where i ask about people's <laughs> fathers i'm so glad we are here together we, we talk a lot on the show about overcoming obstacles uh has there been something that you've really wanted to do that you just couldn't get there or you got there but you had to really push hard and jump over mountains and if that's the case what motivated you to do that I really want to be center fielder for the Boston Red Sox. That did not happen. <laughs> I luck. mean, in part, like, you know what I mean? For me, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be from basically age four up until 18, 17 maybe because I went to college when I was 17. I thought of myself as an athlete, and that's what I loved. I was I played basketball. I played baseball. And, and in other words, that that's where my interest was. I ran cross, cross country. I'm not saying I, I was should have been a professional athlete, but that but that was how I, that's how I thought of myself. As I was a kid, I was always trying to get better at those things. I was interested in those things. I loved being on a team. I loved being with my friends. I loved competing. I didn't, um, you know. So that's how I thought of myself as a guy who loved to watch sports and to do sports. And so it wasn't until when I was no longer doing sports and it was going to be obvious that <laughs> my sports career had ended that I thought, okay, well, I still love being with people and I love, you know, performing, which is, you know, part of what athletics is. Um, how can I do that? And, uh, 
and that's when I started doing plays. And then I mean, it's just it's just hilarious. I mean, you're just doing plays, and you just it's, again, it's like the senior class play, and I was like sitting bull in Annie Get Your Gun, <laughs> and it's just like you're just goofing around, you're just hamming it up, and people are dying. Yep. And you know, there's girls out there. You're so funny, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that that works. Yeah, the girls like you're so funny. I think we should do this again. We should get on the elevated platform where the lights are looking at us and everyone's laughing saying, he's funny. Yeah. How do I get more of that? This might turn out all right. That's and so that's it. That's, I mean, that's it. That's it. Right. I mean, it's, it's it. again, it's always about the girls. We how do you meet the right girl? Well, certainly how, do being you, on how stage. do you distinguish yourself? If you're not the, if you're not going to be the star quarterback, or you're not going to be the star pitcher. You better be in a play making somebody laugh. Cause how'd you, how'd you meet Lisa? I met her at a party with a bunch of my buddies from high school at a Super Bowl party. Really? Yep. Uh, in Newton, Massachusetts in 1994. And now that your uh, quarterback has decided to retire, at least for this week, I keep hearing that he's coming back already. Wait, Brady is <laughs> saying he's going to come back? <laughs> yeah, he said this morning. Uh, did he really? Yeah, I heard it this morning. Yeah, I was watching- uh, Wait a minute, did he, he say it? He, on CBS Morning, he said, don't count me out. That's what I heard. So, oh my God. I mean, I, I can't believe that he'll do that. But then they said, you know, Michael Jordan came back. Maybe he will. Uh, I, I was surprised that he retired anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't see, I don't think I'm going to have any problem with being retired. Like, I Really? I would uh, have boy, no... that's another hour that we could have. It's brutal. It, it You really? know what? Oh, I, I hate it. I hate well, it. Well, you're not retired. We're sitting here talking. Well, I know. But, you know, you know, I used to live on planes, trains, and automobiles. COVID changed everything. And so from from being gone three weeks out of every month to being home for the last two and a half yeah, years, it. it's, it. it's an adjustment. Yeah. And so um, you can't prepare for it. And, um, you know, it's funny. I always tell people you got to find a passion. Mm -hmm. So I went to a, a psychiatrist um, to help people who... Are not good at retiring. And he said to me, you need to find another passion, okay? <laughs> Easier said than done. Yeah. So I've been on that hunt for the last uh, several months. But you're doing it right now. Well, yeah. I mean, th this kind of comes you... naturally, and I love doing this stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, what do you do the other, you know, 25 days of the month is the question, because you can't do this every day. And so um, it's an adventure. Every... But why aren't you teaching? Well, um, I was doing some classes at USC and was asked to... Um, Not come back. Uh, and I said, yeah, well, because they said, would you like to teach a regular class? I said, yes. And they said, what do you want to teach? And I said, I want to teach uh, these kids how to get a job. And they said, we won't allow that to happen because we have a, a group here that teaches kids. Uh, kids how to get jobs. And I said, no, you don't. They, they have no idea. And because I would ask them, you know, you don't go looking for a job your senior year. You go looking for a job your freshman year. Okay. But they didn't want to hear that. So that didn't happen. Uh, but I've been thinking about it at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, well, I would say this, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you have a skill set, like just going back to the first thing we were talking about when I first sat down, how you help me be a better host because you were generous enough to talk about these things and you have insight, you have all this knowledge, how does it pour out? There is something I believe to uh, not just younger people today, but just talking and listening, just like you're doing right now, telling a story. Like my, my kid's like, I got an essay tonight. And, I, and by the way, I used to be the same way when I was in high, high school. I was like, stop thinking about writing. Or I shouldn't, I don't say stop thinking. I said, try not to think about writing as just writing this thing I got to do, I got to write. And it's just, I got to fill up that legal pad with all these words and they're not going to make any sense. And I said, try to start thinking about writing as just telling a story. It's your talking. You got your phone there. You just talk into it. Let me tell you a story about, you know, you're writing about the, I don't know, the Battle of Gettysburg. It started on a wet night and this is the thing. And the guys thought that that and the this and the that and the this and the that. And just get your thoughts down. But I think that what you have is wealth of experience in terms of performing and communicating and being uh, warm that people need to be told. Mm -hmm. So if you went to U UCSB and you said, look, it's got, you know, I'm just going to talk. I mean, bad version. Public speaking course. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that, but you know what? I mean, yeah. I'm dead serious, yeah, man. I know what you mean. There are people who, because of, I'm, I just was doing it the other day. I'm pretty good with turning my phone off. 
But I got this million, you know, I'm as distracted by it as anyone else. And my friend sort of called me and I was like, what's going on? We're over here. We're watching the fight. You're on your phone. I was like, ah, showrunner, I got to get, put the phone down. Yeah. But they're, they're having an ability to communicate what it is that you want. One of the things I was talking about at this production meeting for the show, I said, because I learned this the last go round of heels, I said, we've got to stop emailing and texting everything to everyone. Pick up the phone and talk. People are misinterpreting your thing. It, if I start, if, if, if I'm not on a set where you can't talk because everything's locked up and you got to be quiet and I go into sentence four, I'm like, I can't, you know, I get it. You're texting me from the bathroom. You don't want to call me. Got it. Okay. But other than that, Let's just talk. Have a conversation. It's just, it, it's, it's a and, long And so story. There's, a, there's a value there yeah, in you time. sort of taking all of the things that you, I, you could go teach a course at the Santa Barbara Learning Annex and people would go. Yeah, I suppose they would, you know, and it's, it's something I've been really seriously considering uh, and doing and I, and I should do it. I, it's about helping others. What's the one thing you haven't done that you want to do? That's a good question. Um... You know, I would say that it's probably, you know, in terms of my, I have not found a way in the last 10 years to lock in in a disciplined way to put fitness as as important as creative. And so I have found myself to be living, like, look, I'm busy, you're busy. You said, can you come do this? I was like, okay. Uh, I love Mark. I would love to chat with him. I got to just put this on the schedule. I just got to do it because otherwise I'm gonna be, it's going to be 10 years later and we're going to finally sit down and do it. And so you got to do it, right? But I think that for me, um, I have all, I'm like anyone else. I've always been gaining and losing the same 10 pounds. <laughs> and do I, you know, so I would just say that. I mean, I would say that the, the I don't have like, I moved out from New Hampshire I'm I'm working in television and movies. I've worked with great people. Um, you know, I would like to, I would like to be. I'd I'd love to be in a great movie. I'd love to be in another big movie. You know, I've I've been lucky enough to work with Tom Hanks and Ryan Reynolds and George Clooney. I, mean, I don't go down my list, but I mean, I've I've worked, but I, but I would love to have a, you know, I think a big, um, supporting part in a big movie but i don't even know if there are big movies anymore and i don't want to say that that's that's passed me by i certainly am you know i'm i, I know that i'm capable of it but i would like to do that and i think the thing about show running is it takes you away from that um where you can just focus on the acting one of the things i love about being an actor is that you're you're just a guy on the team and you can lift the people up around you by having a good you know vibe and knowing your stuff and doing it and you're carrying the ball when you want to do it when you're a showrunner, you're the boss, and you can always feel that. Um, you always are reminded of it. Sometimes you have to be reminded of it. You're disappointing people. You're giving them good news. You're giving them bad news. You're te- you know you're deciding in the edit room to take the camera off this person and put it on that person. You're you're changing. You know you're rewriting writers who have written great stuff, and you you have to rewrite it because it doesn't make sense, or or it just doesn't sound like how you want it to sound. And so you're always as a showrunner in sometimes in contention with someone else about how the scene should be shot, how the scene should be acted, how the scene should be written, how the scene should be cut, how the thing. There's always somebody who's like, yeah, well, I think it should be doing different, and I don't want to like to be in contention with people, and I'm, and so I think that that's. So I I, w- I would love to just be back there doing a big comedy where you're just laughing all the time um, with people. Um, I think that that's what I would like to do. Yeah, it, it'll happen. It'll uh, happen. I hope so. It's amazing. Uh, so send me a, a bill uh, for this therapy session. Oh, stop. <laughs> stop. Don't say that. Uh, yeah. This has been great. And uh, I know we've been trying to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the last couple we're, of years. We're, we're, we're going to because I, because I love getting together with you. But I'll say this. You already know your own prescription for what it is that you want to do. You are you love people. You love being with people. I do. You love helping and mentoring people. And that's the thing that's been tough about COVID. We haven't been able to see people. Yeah. And um, it almost feels like a joke was, you know, played on us. And I don't think we've necessarily uh, 
like you can't just pick it up. Like those last two years, they did happen. They are gone. Yeah, they're gone. And and uh, you know, I try to talk to my kids about this. They don't necessarily want to hear it. It's just like, look, yeah, there's a lot of you know, lost your sophomore year of playing baseball. I mean, that the toughest thing I think for the ki- more for the kids than for us is that there's these 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 little lines, right? There's these demarcation lines. Freshman year is different than sophomore year. Sophomore year is different than junior year. Junior year is different than... And that really... Your life kind of up to the age of 25, I think, that's kind of like how life is. Like, it's it changes so much. Like, they're changing right in front of you. Like, you have kids, you take a Christmas... Like, you take the Christmas card from last year and you look at the Christmas card from this year and it's <laughs> like, oh my God, they changed that much still. Yeah. And on and on and on. They feel that. Time moves so much slower for them. And... You think, oh gosh, I got four years of playing baseball. I got four years with my friend. I got cotillion. I got prom. I got this. I got that. And, and then, yeah, it was taken away from them. Right. And they can't ever get it back. And long after you and I are gone, there's going to be books written about the kids of COVID because it dramatically changed their lives. Yeah. And I feel bad for them. I feel my yeah. grandson, who was eight years old, was over the other day and he said, I just want to go somewhere and not have to wear a mask. Yeah, I mean these kids in school with the masks. It's, it's just it's insane. I, I, but I, I, I'm down with the masks. Yeah, I'm no, saying do nobody wants to wear a friggin' mask. By the way, I don't think I'll ever fly in a plane without a mask ever, ever again. I think because right. think about how much you were traveling. This is a great way to wrap this up with a sto- <laughs> with a story about mask wearing. <laughs> Let me tell you what I would do. <laughs> By the way, now you're just with Mike and Mark in the backyard, and people are like, why did they think this will be cut out? This will be cut out. Let's just talk about mask wearing and what we've learned by that. <laughs> K95 or yeah. NK90 or whatever that but, is. But, but the truth is, all the flying that you did, yep. you were taking herbs and you were taking Chinese things, herbs with you all the time and, and, and freaking Dayquil and whatever. It's kind of nice to not have had a bad cold for two years. It's true. I've For two years, I've been in the, <laughs> the best health I've probably have been in. And you know, my thing is right now, my therapy is I walk five miles every day. That's okay? amazing. And that's the best thing ever. And I've got it done. I, do, I can do it faster. I can do it slow. Average is about an hour and 20 minutes. But where I live, luckily, I can turn to the right and go to the mountains or I can go to the left and go to the ocean. And some days I listen to music. Some days I listen to podcasts. Yeah. Some days I talk on the phone and some days I just contemplate my navel. But it's those times of being out there and having nothing to do and no responsibility that have kept me sane over these last two years. Right. And if I didn't have that, I would have imploded, I have a feeling. You know? yeah. so, uh, it's well, don't implode, Mark, and yeah. let's let's uh, figure out how to open up that documentary. <laughs> We're going to do and that. let's do this again. Mike O'Malley, uh, we've unwrapped him pretty good, and he unwrapped me as well. Uh, stay tuned for more coming up next week on Mark Summers Unwraps. Mark Summers Unwraps is a production of Believe Limited, created by me, Mark Summers, and Jessica Richmond. Produced by Keith Corneluck and Jessica Richman. Executive produced by Patrick James Lynch and Ryan Geelan. Post-production support from Joshua Sterling Bragg and Believe Limited. Don't forget to subscribe or follow the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you really love it, why don't you leave us a rating and a review? Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Mark Summers Unwraps. <laughs>